our next lecture. If everybody can settle down, especially in the back, please. Thank you very much. So, uh, basically, uh, modern SOMA, the group, the Society of Magic <coughs> Artists, pretty much started last year with this next speaker. Uh, we had been Facebook friends, so we never really talked or chatted or anything. I was just aware of who he was, very interesting chap. And uh, I'm monitoring Facebook one day when he just types on his wall, see you guys later. I'm going to Austin. And I thought to myself, well, I live in Austin. So I saw he was on and I chatted him up and said, hey, you're coming to Austin? I live in Austin. Would love to see you. Would love to hang out. Uh, maybe we can get together. He said, yeah, I'm doing a lecture. Uh, contact this person. The lecture was full already. And I told him, I said, oh, too bad. The lecture's full. He's like, well, hey, no worries. I will be there for almost two weeks. I'll give you guys and your friends a private lecture. And that's what started uh, the modern SOMA lectures. Uh, we have moved those to webinars now. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, we have a lot of new people for this lecture right here. If you're not a SOMA Facebook member, I encourage you to join. It's completely free. Uh, we have webinars almost every other week. They are completely free. We have amazing occultist speaking and now we have these obviously these live events so David Beth you really helped launch this kick it into the next year I really appreciate it and so without further ado David Beth Well, I'm glad to be here. I didn't know actually that uh, I helped kickstart this uh, series of events, which is great. I think you know it's uh, amazing that these guys put on these things, kind of free for everyone. Uh, it's amazing you, you really find these types of things. So, congratulations! It's amazing. Um, yeah, um, I gotta say, um, I hope you don't mind um, if I sit a little bit in case uh, you can't hear anything, you tell me, then I'll stand up again. But I uh, had the worst night of my life. I had like uh, bouts of insomnia. I didn't even sleep at all. So uh, I feel like you, Andrew, or someone has like zombified me overnight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I was doing so, other work last uh, Yeah, okay, good. So <laughs> I, pretty, I feel pretty shitty, but I hope I can, you know, vampirize some energy off of you guys and feel a little better in the course of the event. Um, so, um, I was thinking hard of uh, how and what I could present uh, uh, at this occasion and um, I've had some discussions with people before um, <clears throat> I came here and they asked me, uh, well, could you talk about Gnosticism, could you talk about Voodoo, could you talk about Sorcery, could you talk about like everything at once? <laughs> so, in, in the end, um, uh, I think uh, what I want to do is, um, as, uh, as much as possible, split this lecture maybe into two parts, kind of give a presentation of 45 minutes about things that I find really uh, extremely important um, to understand uh, the, um, the mechanisms and the orientation and the goals of our work, whether that's Voodoo or whether that's Gnostic or whether that's uh, anything else that I'm associated with. And once I've laid this out and brought a few things in, um, it could be interesting to um, just have some people um, <clears throat> throw some questions at me and uh, we could... Uh, you know, launch into a longer discussion about uh, various of these. I think that could be a really interesting thing to do. Uh, since I'm only here like once a year or so or less, uh, that gives everyone a chance to maybe uh, throw some things uh, out there. So um, I was actually thinking, you know, um, how can I start this all? And, you know, since it's Halloween and uh, uh, one friend here particularly is a Halloween uh, maniac, so uh, since this all deals with uh, the spirits and the dead, so I think a good inroad to launch into what I is, uh, what is what I'm going to try to present here is um, um, is uh, to talk about uh, things like ancestral worship, ancestral worship, and um, how this relates to what we're doing, and how this relates to the bigger picture um, of a certain experience of the world, which I would like to um, discuss with you a little further. So. Well, everybody, I mean, especially in America, not so much in Germany or Europe where we are, but it's coming. Everybody, of course, wants to make a buck. You know, Halloween is a huge thing here. It's a huge commercial um, party time. Everybody has a good time. And um, 
the question though is how do we how do we in the West or how do people that are especially those uh, 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 under the influence of monotheistic religions or atheism or um, you know, uh, Lord Mammon, how do these people relate to the dead? How do these people experience the, uh, 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 the spirit of the dead? And um, when you look at things like um, altars of friends of mine, for example, people who are into uh, esotericism, and you go to their place and they have a little altar and they have like a granny and their, their, their grandfather and um, maybe one or two generations back, um, even normal people, of course, have that, you know, the little pictures at the, uh, the chimney and stuff like that. And when you ask them, so why, why do they have that? Is that like some kind of ancestral worship? Is that some kind of like, you know, deeply, deeply connecting to the dead? No, of course it's not. It's uh, um, a type of memorial. You know, once in a while, every year, you know, they look at it more closely and think about the nice times they had. And that's why usually you only find like uh, maybe one or two generations of deceased you know, amongst these, uh, you know, personal little altars, let's call them. And um, so this is actually what it has come to. Uh, in our culture, dealing with the dead and dealing with the ancestral spirits, when you can even call it that, is basically has come down to a memory service, a memorial service. Once in a while we think about it. Sometimes when you come together at Christmas or so, we think about it. It's the same in uh, most parts of my family. Um, and this reflects a certain experience of the world, because, of course, to us the dead are either dust and bones, and we have nothing more to do with them, they're kind of gone, or if you're a Christian, or, you know, if you're a monotheist, or, um, uh, you know, even an, even an esotericist, but kind of like under a monotheistic uh, paradigm, um, usually these dead are kind of like gone, they're gone to a transcendental beyond some kind of heaven or, you know, wherever they are being sent by the monotheistic religion that teaches usually, of course, you know, that they are back with the monad, back with the god, with the one god and uh, the pleroma, which has, of course, not really anything to do with the flawed material world in which we live. That, of course, the world in, we, in which we live having a negative connotation in uh, contrast to the place the dead go if they were nice, if not there's another place which is not so nice, but also largely unconnected to the place that we live in. So basically, there is a memorial, um, and that's all there is. Some nice, warm feelings when we think about the nice grandmother we had, or our child that died, or uh, 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 people that were close to us, but nothing more than that. We do not have any other connection, although we crave these. So. How is this, for example, in other cultures? How is this, for example, in voodoo? Or how is this in any type of nature religion? Suddenly, you see a totally different picture emerge. You see that the dead are treated as well as they were, as if they were alive. The dead are, um, they are participating in uh, a family's normal life. Um, not, of course, exactly the way they did when they were manifested in the flesh, but uh, in other ways, but equally tangible and equally um, present. So we could actually say the dead to the, let's call it shamanistic or nature religion, um, or the people in nature religions uh, or shamanistic societies, the dead are not dead. The dead are not dead in the sense that they are dead for us. They are, I would say they are kind of transfigured. So they are still there. They still are able to enthuse and get in some kind of contact with the people they were related to. And there are certain types of contracts between the living in the flesh and the living who we would call dead. It's just another type of life. So these, these, uh, these dead do not depart in some kind of transcendental dimension where, you know, they have absolutely zero contact to our um, uh, uh, dimension in which we live, but um, they are around. There is no transcendental dimension. There is no pleroma of, you know, peace and love and harmony, but there's only this world. There's only the phenomenal world, the cosmos, the all, the phenomenal world in which everything takes place. 
And this leads us uh, to the question, why is this the case? I mean, I lived in Africa for a very long time, and uh, in Brazil as well, uh, researching these things. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very intense experience if you see how people in uh, South America or with, with people in Africa basically uh, have their, or in Africa especially, or in, in New Guinea, where they have their, their, their dead buried in their houses because they are drawing them constantly back into this material, physical life. And why are they doing this? Of course, not because they're superstitious. You know, this is a typical colonialist attitude. We think, oh, these poor people, they're so ignorant, they don't understand. You know, they do this because they don't know any better. You know, they don't understand that there's a transcendental dimension. You know, they're, you know, they think the headache, you know, that he uh, perceives is the bad, uh, uh, unhappy granddaddy, you know, who wants to punish him for not, you know, uh, doing what he wanted him to do uh, before he died, or whatever. And we, as um, metaphysical colonialists, or, of course, you know, a cultural colonialist, we automatically assume that our position is the position of um, evolution in a positive sense. I would argue it's actually the position of devolution. I believe that if we look back in history um, and of what we find today in nature religion, um, that the elaborate the, that that the um, elaborate and complex funeral rites, um, death rites, the death cultures, building amazing monuments for the dead, this has nothing to do with some kind of theoretical, um, superstitious idea of uh, what happens, uh, 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 you know, in, this, in, this, in the supernatural world or what happens in the world we don't understand scientifically yet. But I think it has something to do with a deep, with a deep experience these people have in relationship to the dead, or to the spirits of the dead, or any other spirits, as we will see later. I think these people have an ability we have lost. I think the historic humanity has lost, especially in monotheistic uh, environments, they have lost the ability to become enthused, enthused by demonic powers in the most positive sense of the term. Um, or they have failed to, or they fail to become aware and, uh, 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 well, enthused, I think is the best way to, to, to say it. They become, they fail to become enthused by these things because something has veiled our ability to connect. But these people still do, or these people, st these people for sure did, because logic tells me that only a deep experience can give rise and give birth to some of these most elaborate and complex and loving rituals and cultuses which actually even put the cult of the dead before the actual um, everyday affair of the living. And that is because when the dead are released from the flesh, which is also not a negative thing to be in the flesh, but when they are released, they have much more opportunities. And that is why to appease them, and to deal with them as if they were still living people um, gives you the opportunity to have them dispense their blessings upon the community. And there was a type of, and now of course I'm also launching in our personal and our own esoteric teachings, um, I believe there are some type of, it is some, some type of contract. We call it like the open life. There is a type of contract between the living and the dead and in Voodoo, you could see this well, very well reflected, as in other, in other religions too, where the contract is to provide for the deceased a home which they sometimes can come back to, where they can participate in the affairs of the living, where they can do what they could do once they were manifest in the flesh. And in repayment for this, they dispense their blessings, they give protection, they help in all types of magical rituals, um, they bless marriages, they bless births, and all so forth. And um, you can see this in, in Haiti, there are, these, uh, there are these rituals where once a year you pull out the, the feast, or you put the feast down, and you have the seat for the deceased, and they were being served as, uh, you know, uh, uh, everybody else gets served. And um, it is... Um, it is unbelievable for me, 
when I hear people say, well, this is just out of ignorance. This is not out of ignorance. We are quite ignorant because we don't understand or we don't experience what these people can experience. We are impoverished because we have not the possibility that these people have. And we live in a world in which we are isolated, in which we are, in, in which we are basically alien, from which we are actually alienated. So this brings me to a bigger picture, to the picture where we could say two, two worldviews or two experiences of the worlds collide. And one we could call the biocentric worldview, uh, kind of try to explain what this means to me, and the logocentric worldview, or the logocentric experience. And um, in the biocentric uh, experience of the world, we have what I just tried to ex which I just tried to explain a little bit. We have uh, the ability of the individual to open himself or uh, to be let's let's try to find the right English word here quickly. Uh, where the individual is able to connect in a symbiotic way with the enthusing forces of the cosmos, with the pandemonic cosmos. And this worldview um, would consider any monotheistic projection of uh, an uber-ego, a transcendental ego, um, a pleroma, uh, a monad, it would reject this. Because the pleroma is the, is the phenomenal world. The, pl the, the pleroma is the world in which we live, but not the world most people experience. It is not the world a logocentric, um, monotheistic person experience, because he has been removed from the ability to connect to these enthusing powers which are hidden in every phenomenal appearance. To give you an example, um, if you go to Africa or to Haiti, you see offerings on trees. And um, again, we think, oh, the, poor, the poor, poor African man is so, is so naive, he puts a, a little ribbon or something on this tree that blocks the road and he never uh, uh, takes the street because you know, he's afraid that the uh, uh, a spirit that lives in this tree is going to punish him if you know, he kind of saws the tree in two parts and removes it. Well. Um, of course, we would take out the chainsaw and, you know, remove that, uh, that thing and, you know, be on our way, of course. Um, this is because we only see a tree. We only see um, an analyzable object, you know, which we can, of course, with our superior science, you know, um, uh, 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 analyze in the greatest detail, um, which, in contrast for the, voodoo, for the voodooist or for the... Uh, uh, for the African in his uh, in his tribal environment, he doesn't see that. He doesn't he doesn't care. It's not important to him like how many molecules uh, are in this tree and how exactly everything functions in re in relation to the water being pumped through or whatever. What he sees is the nature of the tree. He sees that which lives in the tree, or which or better this. He sees the character of the tree, that which makes the tree appear. So. He sees basically the enthusing power which is hidden in the phenomenal appearance. I hope that makes some kind of sense. And I can give you a, a, a tangible example of how this functions. For example, um, when you look at a beautiful tree, like most of us, we just look at a beautiful tree and say it's either beautiful or I don't care, or it's whatever, it's like any other tree, it's green, it's nice, or it's whatever. But so we have a reaction to it, but it's a very shallow reaction. It's a reaction. You know, um, basically, um, you know, on the on the surface of emotional response, um, if at all. And it's a tree we can always recognize. I can tell my friend, oh, this look at this tree, it's kind of nice. You know, it's, yeah. And we describe it, and tomorrow I say, like, remember that tree? And yeah, you know, we can do this. We can we can rationally analyze and describe the tree. Maybe it has an effect on us, but as an object, we the subject check out the object and you know, we are alienated from it in some way, but of course we have a, you know, we like it or we dislike it. 
Um, but there are moments, for example, when, I don't know, maybe we sit somewhere and there, the sun shines on the tree in a certain way, maybe the uh, leaves sparkle or something, and you know, there's something magical about it. Like, we look at it and suddenly we are sucked into it. You know, there is this moment where you are beside yourself. You know, and then maybe you only snap out of it when somebody comes and kind of like says, hey, you know, let's go, or you know, your, your, your phone rings. And then you snap out of it and you're like, oh my god, you know, what just happened? And that's the point I'm, that's the point I'm trying to make. Is this enthusing power, this demonic, seducing power, which can suck you in and basically um, annihilate um, your profane ego personality, with which, of course, you uh, usually analyze and um, evaluate the world. So, in the, in the environments where still a little bit of this ability is naturally um, present, like in Africa, or maybe in parts of Haiti, although it gets uh, watered down and diluted there as well, all the time, um, people still do this. And you can see it reflected in all these rituals, you know? Why would anybody put a ribbon there? Why would anybody pay respect to the tree? These people are not stupid. These people, you know, they've have, they have read enough books and, and seen enough TV um, to know what we know, oftentimes. You know, but why do they still do this? Because they have a different experience. So they have an experience which is not impoverished. It is an experience... Uh, it's... they live basically in a more symbolic world than we live, in a magical environment of symbols and of, of deeper meaning. And I think the reason why a lot of Westerners um, feel so alienated from their world or from their environment is because of this. It's because they failed, or they fail, to be able to experience the phenomenal universe um, as it really is. And this means they judge it negatively. This means there must be something else. This means they project it out. This means they project the perfection into some kind of transcendental realm of ideas or of uh, whatever the brain can develop. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, Jehovah or whether it's Allah or whether it's even, I would go as far as to say, even if it's uh, Osiris or Ra or Kuit, it doesn't matter. Any monad or, or monotheistic paradigm has the tendency to take people away from the material, phenomenal world. And that is um, a problem. And it is also a problem for the materialist. The materialist is, of course, not the person I'm describing. He's not the biocentric man. The materialist is, of course, even more impoverished because he's, he has even slayed the monotheistic uh, uh, projection um, the, the monotheistic fantasy uh, uh, of hope uh, in, uh, that he had projected before, that his peers projected, and now he has nothing. Now he's just this impoverished material reality in which he finds himself isolated and alienated, which he is constantly afraid of. He's constantly afraid of, I don't know, Ebola, um, uh, 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 tsunamis and uh, volcanoes and all kinds of things. And this is because he, he perceives himself in a hostile environment. Go to the pygmies in, in Congo, if you can still find some, and um, ask how they perceive the environment. They are not afraid of a tree falling on their head. They are not afraid of the big spider stinging them or something. Um, they are not afraid of death in the sense that we are, because they perceive the world in a completely different way. And so, I believe all the constructs of monotheism, all the constructs even of magic in which we project our um, hopes and dreams outwards, in which we say, well, this world is flawed, this world is problematic, there is pain, there is you know, hate, there is uh, terrorism, there is this and that. I believe all these occurrences and all these problems, they are a result of the continuous alienation between the physical body, and I'm not, I not mean the human physical body, but the phenomenal world, including the physical body of humans, and the soul, which is the meaning of the body, or which is the enthusing power that houses itself in the body. And what actually puts the wedge in there 
And what makes this union suddenly not working so well anymore is the logocentric influx, what we could think is consciousness, yeah? Um, the identity, the I, yeah? I am me when I'm five years old, or I, I feel I, the same I when I'm 30, and the same I when I'm 50. My body changes, but I am uh, still I. And it's interesting because uh, 30 years ago, uh, not 30 years ago, I'm not quite that old, 20 years ago, uh, I, was, I, was, I was learning, uh, I, was, I was into Gnosticism a lot, and I still am, and I was uh, studying all these Gnostic things, and I was actually then teaching and learning the exact same things, like, great, the I, the never-changing I, that's what we want to achieve. Because the never-changing I is our Godhead, is what connects us to the Pleroma. This is what we all have, the I, that... Um, that never changes, and when we realize this, then we know we're all connected because we all have that, and that's that's the divine spark which allows us, you know, to recognize ourselves as God witnessing um, the world, or witnessing his uh, uh, his activities, and so forth. And um, and in the course of studies, you know, of course, suddenly you see the truth is actually the inversion of this. This never changing. Nothingness, basically, um, is actually that which disallows us to connect to those forces of the universe which I've tried to explain. It, uh, it, uh, it makes us aware of us always only in contrast to an object or to the other. It takes us out of a world of, I would say, out of a holistic world, where the world arises only through colliding of polarities, of forming syzygies, of, of one soul colliding or connecting to another. I am connecting with the character of the tree or the character of the water or the enthusing power of my environment. The sudden appearance of the, of the ego, of the I identity, is suddenly that which puts me at odds with everything else. And the more this develops, of course, you know, the more I have a problem, because the more I feel alienated, and I must find something else. And what do I find? Of course, I need to connect with the source, the source of the divider, the source of that which divides me from life. Because of course, you know, that's what I feel, I'm the I, and there must be an über I somewhere. So, um, there you have it, monotheism, uh, the God, the Roma, where, what you have it. And um, all our lives then, we become either you know, if we are very religious people, and we become like the poor desert fathers, you know, well respect in many ways, but the poor guys, you know, <coughs> then sit in the little uh, cave in the desert, you know, trying to, um, you know, be as uh, chaste and as uh, ascetic as possible, um, castigating their bodies, um, trying to get closer to God um, through uh, as little external seduction as possible, basically projecting and um, fusing with this final projection. And that's a sad, sad state, you know? Um, I like to bring, I like to, 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 bring this, uh, to bring this quote up because it's, it, it shows that poor dilemma. There's this one desert, but I don't know who it was, maybe Craig remembers that, who said like, for 30 years, he was one of the big, big names, right? He's like, wow, for 30 years or 40 years I'm here in the desert you know, castigating my body, doing everything, um, you know, that has been prescribed to, you know, find God, to, to, to realize God in the true sense of the word, in the word. But every day I dream about the horse in Rome, you know, and I was like, poor guy, you know. You know, I would have another recipe for him probably, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's a little bit more, you know. But this is the point, you know. And there's the materialist. You know, then it says, like, okay, you know, I am me, there is no God, you know, I have abolished even that, so even the, the identity has not even then said, like, okay, from first of, the first stage is then monotheism, where we all project it out, but then, you know, this eats even that, and then suddenly, you know, only the I is God, the little I, you know, the little guy, the little man, this, this, you know, the little ant man, and he suddenly is the God. You know, and um, so, and you can also see it in the delusion of many so-called thalamites. You know, there are great thalamites there, and I think you know it's important for thalamites to teach. You know, um, this sometimes even a little bit more clearer. You know, 
and not only say yeah the true will and you know I think they have to make it more clear what it even what it really means because I mean if I would think that let's say even 50% of the Telomites I meet are living gods you know I can't doubt that you know that's not a pantheon I would like to live in you know so but it's the same with the materialist the materialist that walks around and says okay fuck it there is nothing left there is no um, you know, there is no God, so I have to make the best out of what I have now. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of this. Everybody's going to steal my, my TV. I'm working hard. And these people, you know, they play hard, they work hard, and their whole life evolves around um, chasing things that make them happy while they are alive, accumulating wealth. And of course, then comes in the possibility to manipulate them, you know. And, but they're, so they're chasing what they are being suggested or what they think makes them happy. And of course, you, they're never happy because they're constantly afraid. I got this great car, hmm, they're gonna steal it. Oh, I got this great TV, but my neighbor has a better one, and you know, they're laughing at me, so I gotta get another one. So constantly you're, you're concerned with this, and then you're concerned to die as well, because it's the only thing you have. You die, then what's it? Then that's it, you're dust and bones, and then the only thing that remains maybe is the inheritance you can give to your kids or uh, you know, a, a bigger gravestone than your neighbor so everybody's still jealous when they pass it. You know, he's a big man, you know, he's a big, big, big gravestone there. So, and that's all that, and so, and then the, and this, this is the horrible thing because they're constantly afraid. They're constantly afraid. They're constantly afraid to die or do something. And then sometimes, you know, they think they're the powerful. And the more powerful they seem, the more afraid they are, because the more powerful they seem, the more they're afraid the power is taken away from them. So, of course, there is no power there at all, you know, because if you have power, you're not afraid, right? So, um, we find ourselves in a world um, that is very problematic, and we, in our, in our work, we try to return to a more biocentric experience of the world. We try to reduce the impact of that force, which has different names. It, what is it? The spirit, the logos, the whatever agent um, that created the, 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 the nothingness, basically, you know, which creates our feeling of identity. We try to reduce this, not to annihilate it, because it is in the system, and um, as long as in the system, you know, it's probably um, impossible to expel it. And um, also, it would, in a world like this, would make us probably, um, you know, a not very happy people because we, were, you know, we couldn't even live in a biocentric way because, you know, we basically live uh, more and more in a certain type of industrial wasteland. So, so what one needs to do is to reduce the impact of this logocentric power, which we all feel. Um, you can be you can be a Satanist, or you can be a Luciferian, or whatever it is. You can you know you can um, glorify your own identity and uh, uh, and whatever not, but it still you know doesn't afford you in any type of way to interact with the demonic powers in the true sense of the word. So we need to reduce the power of that adversary, the actual adversary, right? Um, the adversary to um, to prevent us from seeing the world as it truly is. We must stop this adversary from um, making us, when I look outside of the window and see a tree, um, that only makes me see the tree, but I don't want to see only the tree. I want to be enthused by it. I want to have the ability to truly be enthused by it. And not only by fantasy. I don't want to go out, uh, look outside and say like, yeah, no, that's cool, I'm going to hug it, and then, you know, I'm going to feel something. That's not what I, mean. <laughs> I want to be erotically seduced by it in the most profound sense of the term. I want this to be a type of mating, a demonic mating of the passive soul of humanity, or the passive soul of the human, and there are big teachings why the human soul in relation to the uh, demonic, pan-demonic uh, uh, world is passive. But I want to be able to be erotically seduced by it and then mate my soul to this soul or my demonic self or my demonic soul to this demonic enthusing power and when this happens the real world arises in voodoo uh, we have the secret or the mysteries of la prise des yeux which is the seizing of the eye when the lower or the spirit comes in and seizes the eye 
and takes you into his world and you know imparts all types of secrets. And this is basically in, of course, uh, our interpretation or the ones I have been privy to. Um, this is what it is: is the seizing. The demo it's the demonic encounter between Loa and human, which then produces the vision, the elemental vision, of the true reality. And once this happens, um, you become completely possessed um, and enthused by these powers. This doesn't mean yet you have to be rolling on the floor like crazy, but this enthusing can, and this possession um, can happen in various ways. It can happen like the Maynards, uh, uh, who are, I don't know, possessed by Dionysus, um, who then run out and you know, do all kinds of things, or it can be in a much more subtle way. But what is important to us is that we return to ourselves the ability to, first of all, get in touch again with the powers of the pandemonic cosmos, interact with them, see the reality of the world, which then has all types of consequences like the um, loss of fear of death, um, all types of, uh, all types of uh, revolutionary therapeutic um, results, although um, I believe uh, it's very important that most people do psychotherapy before, you know, <laughs> to answer, so I'm, I'm uh, in total agreement with my uh, colleague here who had had this talk before. Um, but it, it will give the human being a completely different set of opportunities and a completely different set of skill. And this also has huge implications um, in regards to sorcery. Because I believe that sorcery and magical powers are the transportation of the experience and the demonic qualities of the encounter, the demonic encounter, what we call night consciousness, to transport this experience and this power into day consciousness. I believe all theologists of the, of the old times, all magicians and all sorcerers in, 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 in voodoo, in Africa, in wherever, um, are doing that. They are trying to bring into day consciousness, into our awakened consciousness and life where we can direct our things, where we can strategically do stuff. They try to bring into this waking state the experience and powers they encounter in the night consciousness. And if you don't do that, then I believe magic and uh, sorcery are just nothing but theatrix. Um, I used to give talks in England and stuff like that, and I would, I would, I would tell these people, you know, who are sitting there, very, very self-defined, powerful magicians, you know, and I would tell them, you know, I'll be your guinea pig. Go home, do ritual, kill me. Destroy me. Make my life miserable. You know, it's funny. You know, uh, so many people into magic, and actually, you know, even even our good friend Alistair Crowley and Austin Spare and stuff like that, everybody knows these people, you know. Poor guys, man, they were totally unsuccessful. You know, I mean, like what, every, every one ritual out of ten worked, you know, when you look at, the, uh, at Crowley's diaries, and Spare was the poorest bugger in London, you know, the guy pawned his, uh, his, his, uh, his paintings in the pub for a beer, you know, and bagged Candace Grant for tea bags. I mean, um, and Robert Ansel, uh, a friend of mine uh, from Fulger, he used to once said, like, I mean, if Austin Spare was so convinced that his sigil magic, for example, would work, you know, why, why was he the poorest guy in, in, in his, on his block? And why was he actually not using the sigils for 20 years? You know? And he's totally correct. I believe this is absolutely correct. And I, and, and, and I believe for a lot of people, magic in the West and sorcery has become something like um, a cool thing to do. You know, something like, you know, you do rituals and it gives you a good feeling, you know, it's a bit edgy, you know, and, um, you know, you, you have cool costumes on, or, you know, even better, you're nude, you know. And um, so it becomes a little bit edgy in a boring world, in a world where everything has lost the meaning, and you have to give it a little bit of, an, of a spiritual edge. And of course, we, we don't like Christianity anymore, it's boring, we go to church, you know, who wants to listen to a one-hour rambling and boring. But, um, you know, it's much cooler to sit, you know, with your friends in an awesome costume and, you know, uh, invoke the devil, right? Um, but the funny thing is, you know, and so, I mean, and the thing is, you know, if the devil really would come, hmm, 
Yeah, well, then look good, right? If it's that the devil that, you know, we all read about, it's, that's another thing. I mean, I would fucking invoke the devil. I mean, you know, the devil, like, that they actually talk about in the Bible, the devil that's going to come and, like, enslave your soul, you know? It's kind of weird to me, but okay. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think there are other, like, you know, kind of foolish forces out there that I would prefer. But, um, I mean, see, but of course we can talk about this and laugh about this because it is funny. Because it is, for most people, not real. You know, it's something that we like to talk about, it's a subculture, you know, it's something that, you know, you do, you know, to be kind of cool, you know, and it's, I understand that. And I don't, and, and, and seriously, I, I don't want to insult anybody, um, but I think it's important because my concern is that people who are really interested in this, I don't care about, you know, the subculture people who just want to be a bit edgy, you know, that's, you know, whatever, but I'm concerned and I'm interested to, in people who really want to look for something, and then they go from place to place, they go from playground to playground, you know, Everybody advertises their services, you know, as great, uh, 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 I don't know, occult groups uh, who give you the greatest, you know, powers and stuff like that. And then I look uh, oftentimes at who these people are, and they are very, very, very humble people. As in, not humble themselves, but, you know, they are kind of broken down personalities, lots of them. It's a, it's, and I don't see empowered people, really. You know, I see people who need therapy. I need people. Uh, I see people. I see people who need like a hug and need a family. <laughs> I see people need a family. Some people who are looking for someone, you know. Some people who don't make it in the in the in the real world outside, you know. And that's a, it's a cruel world out there, man. You know. And it's a funny thing. It's in some very the world out there. They can't do it. You know. They're marginalized. So they they come into the arena of magic, you know, where they find their peers and where everybody can be somebody really quick. It's very easy to be like the grandmaster of this or the great master of that and, you know, lord so-and-so and whatnot, you know. And, um, and so you find lots of lords and lots of cool people and everybody, of course, you know, you find a family real quick, you know. And, um, of course, when you can think of yourself as someone who has superior power, the slaves shall serve, you know. Like the funny guy, you're like the poorest, the poorest guy with bad health and, and absolutely nothing going on. But, you know, you feel better about everybody else out there. You feel better than everybody else out there because, you know, they are the slaves in your fantasy, you know, and it's, I think it's a way to cope with reality, and it's sad because it doesn't lead anywhere, it just continues to grow the illusion or the delusion, and um, it ends usually pretty bad, you know, it usually ends pretty bad for a lot of people, and I've seen this happen to a lot of my friends, or colleagues, or associates, or people we know in the scene, and uh, I think Serious seekers, they must understand that there must be a very, very reflected research of who it is they're dealing with. They must see what is their own motivation for doing what they're doing. And they must be ready to um, undergo, in my opinion, rigorous training. I, do, I have absolutely no understanding for people who think they become great magicians by reading books only, or, you know, doing the little rituals at home which they read in books, or, you know, they stitch together their little magical paradigms by taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you know, most, usually the things that please most in a system, and then, you know, we put them together, supermarket of religion, what is it, Max Weber said that or someone? George? I don't know, who said that, supermarket of religions? Uh, maybe it's a little early for a favor, I'm okay. not sure. Some Frankfurter Schule type, but... Um, so, you know, this is what happens. You know, people just kind of play around, um, you know, stitch together their little magical world, um, and basically nothing, they have nothing going on. They have, not, they have nothing going on uh, which is any better than what they had before, except the temporary relief of um, the feeling of being marginalized, because they have a peer group who validates them. All right? That's, that's usually, and I've been around the block now for so many years, that this is what you usually see. There are, of course, the rare gems out there. There are, of course, and we all had these experiences, I bet. You know, we all had, you know, times where we were a little bit confused what was going on or uh, uh, this and that. But I think in the end, we need to come to that point where um, we become serious or we don't. And now I'm going to make a controversial statement because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to make a controversial statement. I really truly believe that to achieve in magical 
education and especially spiritual education and spiritual realization, you need a teacher. You need a mentor, master, teacher, call it what you want. But you don't need a buddy. It's not your buddy. It's, it's somebody else. It's an initiator. And it's not only the initiator who gives you, you know, a school type degree. It's not, you know, you learn you know, four handshakes and a step, you know, and three, uh, uh, you know, uh, phrases or, or, or poems by heart. And then, um, you know, you get the initiator comes and, you know, lays on the hands and says uh, a few words and leads you around the room like he does with everybody else the exact same way. You know, this school type initiation this, uh, is good for some things maybe. It is good maybe for uh, do, inducing certain states of mind which are, in my opinion, of course, important for, for magical learning. But at the same time, what it doesn't really do is give room for individual growth and the addressing of individual needs within a spiritual education. So our work, um, and I'm not saying this is better than, it's, it's just my personal opinion, obviously, right? And I totally accept anybody else's opinion as well. Um, uh, uh, but I believe that uh, we, for example, we work more like a Sufi group. You know, there is work being done on a more outer level, outer court, let's call it, people who have, like, you know, intellectually understood uh, a lot of important things and, you know, they can actualize them in their own work individually and, um, you know, uh, manifest them on a, on, a, on, a, on a certain level. But uh, that is not the, the work that is important for us. The important work takes place between teacher and student, where you create an esoteric space, an esoteric field of power in which things, trans in which things transmit, in which things transpire, and um, in which most important transmissions and seeds are being given and planted. And there are a lot of important um, factors on how to nurture these things and how to, you know, um, grow this sphere of power between uh, 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 these between these two people and um, how then to implement initiation. Initiation, um, in the truest sense of the word, may happen. You know, there are these initiations, of course, or transmissions where you do certain things. You know, where certain ritualized actions take place, usually though um, individualized. But at the same time, um, initiation and transmission most often happens also um, in unplanned times when you spend time with your initiator or your teacher. It can happen because, you know, and it's again, maybe a meeting of souls, maybe a, a time that somehow is right, the constellation is right, and something transpires. And it's not something that some people tell me, well, but everybody can be my teacher. All my friends that I have, they teach me something. Well, my cat's my teacher. My dog's my teacher. <laughs> yeah, okay. See, and, and, and then you know, it becomes it becomes a, a huge, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm laughing too. It's like, okay, what can I say? Yeah, you're probably right. You know, what can I, you know there's no way to argue with that. You know, and it's just, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, yeah. We hope the best for them. And um, so, in the end, you know, um, uh, it's these moments when things truly transpire. I've had this happen many times. I've, uh, ha I have uh, uh, colleagues that have this happen many times. Craig, wrote, uh, Craig uh, Williams here uh, wrote an amazing book, uh, which details a lot of important esoteric, uh, 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 well, esoteric uh, matters uh, uh, in relation to this uh, teacher-student relationship um, and how it applies to the left-hand half. So, I mean, um, I believe that this nurturing relationship, which takes a lot of effort and time from the teacher, which takes a lot of effort and time from the student, um, and which uh, must be worked uh, in the most serious and the most engaged type of way, this will lead to results. And this is what you can see with great Sufi masters, with, with great adepts of voodoo, with great masters of Ifa, or with great masters of, um, you know, natural uh, shamanistic traditions, you know. It's funny, you know, now that's, uh, okay, I'm derailing, the train's derailing, I'm too tired, but, um, <laughs> but it is, it's fun, the, the thing is, you know, nowadays what's simple, my, my friends uh, are totally into the ayahuasca cult, okay. See, now that's the thing, like, if you're in the, if you're in the, if you're in the jungle, you know, studying with a shaman in a serious way for years, you know, and the guy, and, Interestingly enough, the ayahuasca shaman is someone who actually speaks 
to the empowered universe. He is the one who connects to the demonic forces of the all. He is the one who speaks to the tree. The ayahuasca plant is actually a spirit. And he is the one who really connects to these forces and then employs the plant in a specific way. And if you want to study with him, you need first of all to uh, be able to enter that same mindset. Otherwise, you're always an outsider. Otherwise, you'll never understand. It's the same as in voodoo. If you enter voodoo and you cannot relate to this mindset, this biocentric uh, consciousness, I think you'll always be an outsider. <coughs> in the rituals, yes, you know, and you, and you think you feel the lower stuff, but it's not the same thing. So, um, the ayahuasca card is so interesting that people say like, oh, I'm just dropping our ayahuasca and the, and the plant is teaching me. I'm like, this is the way in the West. You know, then there comes these guys here who have like, you know, a pipeline of ayahuasca juice, you know, and then, you know, they, they distribute it to the, you know, in cool ayahuasca parties and then it happens. I've seen it in, in, in England. I used to live in England. It happened all the time, you know. And yeah, you, you know it, right? Well, yeah. I mean, and, I, I've actually used shrooms in several of our internal house of rituals and no one in my house will, I mean, put kind of, kind of fairy magic. No one will do shrooms unless I've properly lost them anymore because the experience is so radically different. There you go. Exactly the same as I yes, was. you know, and then these people, these, so, so you can see this, this, this inert fear, this inert fear um, of uh, 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 learning. This inert fear, because in the West we have the fear of, oh my God, having a teacher means submission, you know, and we haven't paid anything, which means the guy doesn't owe us, you know, or we pay something, and you know, people in the West they only like to have a teacher if they pay like a fee for college or something. Mm -hmm. Then the teacher has to, but then the teacher can only teach you know, um, rational science, because we can kind of like calculate what he teaches. Okay, these credits he taught us, he taught us, so it's okay. You know, but as soon as it comes to metaphysical matters, you know, um, it becomes a dodgy thing. Everything, everybody wants everything for free, everybody, you know, um, wants to only be taught as long as you're going to be validated, and you know, as long as you get your back patted because you do so well. Um, and as long as these things happen that you really want happening. And um, so, it's just, it's so and, and to finish the ayahuasca story, it's, it's, it's sad because these people think they drop ayahuasca, the plant teaches them, and they have the greatest amazing insights, you know, um, the, 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 the proper shaman would say, like, these guys have a delusion, they take a, they take a drug, and then, you know, they go off on their rails, they have, like, you know, a, kind of a, a, a great experience, maybe there are actually even partly some insightful things happening, you know, but the funny thing is, they're totally out of context. You know, that doesn't make an ayahuasca priest or an ayahuasca shaman. That makes you a guy who dropped, uh, you know, a drug which may or may not have unearthed some, you know, um, interesting insights. But that's all about it, you know. And that's what people in the West need to understand. That only systematic work with a teacher will lead to results. Um, and, of course, you can differ, you can, you can think, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you know, your cat teaches you everything at night, or whatever, it's fine. Um, but I believe this doesn't happen. And um, uh, uh, if success is your proof, you know, then I see a lot of failure and very little success in the esoteric Western community. You know, and this is something we have to face as people who are in that esoteric or Western esoteric community. We have to face that... Um, that incredible failure of most people in most schools to raise adults. And this, is, and this is, in my opinion, because not only the people are lacking motivation, but it's because people lack the real experience. And this experience, unfortunately, can only be gained by the proper training that happens with the teacher. And once the experience drops, once a real experience happens, it becomes so powerful and so revolutionary, revolutionary that it is that self motivation is never going to be a question. You know, I, I, um, we all know that in these uh, usual uh, occult orders, of which I, of course, have been a member as well. You know, you you have always such a hard work to motivate people to do anything. You know, oh man, you have some nothing. You have, can you write something? Can you? Oh my God, can we do this? Can we do that? And I'm always asking myself, my God, you know, I mean. Isn't, isn't like, you know, you claim to be like a great magical master, isn't that motivation like you really are? You know, you must have these amazing experiences, you may, you know, um, wield these amazing powers, you know, to manipulate reality, but of course it's not true. They have no experiences whatsoever, except in their little rituals that they do with their friends when, you know, it's this, it's this quick fix, you know. 
of a certain type, of an edgy type, you know. Um, and that's all there is to most people, and that's all that happens. And at best, often, what happens is a type of refinement on the more mental level, a type of abstract, uh, ref a therapeutic, maybe, uh, 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 refinement, maybe like a Jungian analysis. I'm, for example, very, very strictly against, um, although I respect Jung as a therapeut and uh, what he does for therapy, but I'm very, 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 very skeptical and um, I reject the opinion that magical work is basically Jungian analysis. You know, I used to speak to, to good friends of mine um, back in the days who would uh, argue, oh, it doesn't matter, um, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, Rao Put uh, or the demons or the, the, the Clifford or whatever they deal with, it's, it's, it's just the unconscious, you know, it's like, you know, you integrate, you know, the dark powers with the consciousness and, you know, and you know, not, not, don't laugh, it's true, that, that's, that's what people are saying, and, um, and that's all there is. It's basically, you know, um, an, an alternative union. Um, a path of uh, uh, enlightenment or transformation, just a kind of, you know, um, integrating unconscious elemental powers with, you know, the more intellectually refined uh, 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 transcendental ego or whatever, um, or e or, or refined ego. And, um, I believe this is not true. I believe magic and spiritual and, and spiritual experience is literal mating of inner forces and out external forces. I believe that the soul of the individual practitioner must connect in a esoteric, erotic type of mating, and erotic in the most profound sense, with the characters of the phenomenal appearance of the world. And that could be even time and space. When this happens, magic takes place. The real world arises. The profane world collapses, and even the fantasy and um, desperate, hopeful projection of a monotheistic paradise or realm or God, which you know emits, emits his power, collapses. And once this world arises truly for the for the practitioner on a larger level, when all his acts are basically fed by um, these encounters then he basically is like a god, because he's constantly enthused by god energies. Because, of course, these demonic forces are nothing but gods. The more far they are removed, the more powerful they arise in our, in our experience. So, when we, sp when we then start to combine, and that's just the last thing I'm going to say before we can discuss a few other matters uh, in question and ask or something. Um, I believe we must reduce this analytical, mechanical, will-directed, profane, profane self in favor of uh, this demonic experience which I have uh, tried to describe in the course of this little uh, lecture, um, so that when we are directing our attention, when we are uh, strategically doing something, that everything we do is empowered and informed and basically ruled by the demonic encounters we've had. Then, you know, we can employ this power which actually divides us from life, which actually divides us from the true reality and either projects us out into some kind of nothingness, in Buddhism it would be a positive nothingness, I would believe, um, but it's still a nothingness, it divorces us from everything. Um, it will allow us to indulge in the true pleroma, which is the phenomenal world, and its nimbus and aura, which gives us access to its characters, to its souls, to its meaning. Then the world of meaning arises. And um, this is what we need to do. This is, uh, we must make our activities, our, our strategic life, our willfully directed life, informed by these encounters. Then we can live a harmonious life, a life that is uh, very powerful, lacks fear, um, because, you know, the ideas of life and death have completely changed. There is no dualism in this sense. But it's also not a, uh, this non-dual gnosis of some monotheistic uh, or more monotheistic religions. Um, but it is the empowered life of a true, let's call it deified, um, 
human being. Uh, yeah, and maybe now we could uh, have some questions and answers. Um, and uh, yeah, wrap this up. Oh, George, yes, please make it not make it so complicated. <laughs> actually, actually, I think this uh, may be very simple. Okay. You've uh, you've described the biocentric worldview in contrast to logocentric, mainly at least for the you know modern profane person as a corrective. Like this is what needs to be you know adopted for practice instead of these abstractions of the spirit and so on. But if the biocentric worldview is basically normal to a person, say from an indigenous society who's not modern or profane, what is it that distinguishes the adept? What, what is the biocentric practitioner uh, actually trying to become, which is remarkable for uh, the elite in some way? I believe um, <clears throat> in the indigenous society, I believe there are very few, or maybe even there is no indigenous society that still has a complete, let's call it biocentric man. I think that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, some more, some less, right? But I believe that um, the adept can use um, the power of the biocentric experience in a much more strategic way. The sorcerer, for example, could, re, uh, could employ the experiences of night consciousness in very you know, strategic um, sorcerous actions, you know, which then in some way would of course be in harmony with these worlds of powers, worlds of biocentric powers, um, because they are informed by this. So, so I mean, you know, uh, 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 the, the voodoo sorcerer, the bokor, or these types of people, um, that, would be a, that would be an example. Does it make any sense? Like, uh, so, so, so you, so you, you're not purely biocentric, but your action is empowered by it. So you grab the vitalism from it, and um, you lead the, bi you let, you leave, you allow the biocentric experience to rule um, your overall experience. You know, and just use that will. So you don't have a will to power anyone. That profane sense, but you use your um, your skills or your ability to strategically or willfully. Um, orientate yourself um, to be empowered by these night conscious um, experiences. Because if you don't, it becomes totally empty. It becomes weak. Then it becomes, you know, uh, it's not, it's not, it has no vitalism. It has no energy. You understand? Yes. Anybody else? Yes? I have a question. Um, is there a role, though, for, say, the Western mystery schools that we've been talking about for most of the day to day uh, to reestablish that context that is missing yes. uh, for the modern, yes. you know, profane yes, yes. person. Yes. You know, I had 400 years of yes, yes. rationalism yes. Sort of developing <laughs> I think it's, from that. Yes, that I think be the starting point that then leads to to that to biocentric worldview. I think it's possible. As uh, I'll give you an example, where I think it's possible is where you still have kind of. Well, you still work with entities in the in the in a proper sense of the word. For example, um, if if someone would approach the Guesha, like you would approach Voodoo Loas, and kind of reform this type of approach, basically, if you try to go back to the roots of the um, Judeo-Christian magical tradition, which I think is informed by pre-monotheistic golden calf type environments, um, that if you return. Uh, to these types of uh, exper or these types of paradigms, then yes, I think it can be reformed. And of course, if the role of the teacher is empowered in a Western mystery tradition, if this is not taking place, um, I believe that um, it, it it is it, it's it's rather empty. It's rather powerless. It it becomes more of a theatrics, you know, because um, you are ruled just by you know you can't do the you have to do the right step, and then you know if you, this, if it's, this is off, it doesn't work, and it becomes this. No, there's no power there, I believe. There's no real power there. Uh, but if you can, if you can um, drop this, even in Goetia, if you can drop this, you know, the circle and the triangle and this dualistic uh, attitude towards the powers, but you find um, a type of uh, empowerment of the soul, and this is what we do in our work as well. Of course, there's a very complex and very, very, very... Uh, 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 yeah, well, complicated work uh, in which you remove the layers that veil the soul and the layers which kind of cloud 
the ability to connect to these forces. And I think, of course, if we work with goetic spirits or you know demonic forces of you know the more Western um, paradigms or whatever, of course we need, as a Western occultist that has not any other experience, we need to be we need to have precautions, you know, because um, we do not know how to encounter such powerful demonic energies or no characters, energies not characters. Um, so I think if. Uh, if the Western esoteric tradition takes some of these um, ideas and, and tools and reforms the traditions from within and kind of connects them to a more um, uh, pre-monotheistic environment, it could be possible. If the right person comes along and does it, I think it's possible. It really is. And uh, this goes exactly also for um, you know, things like um, paganism. Uh, heathenism. You know, I, th I find nothing more funny than, um, you know, people who c reconstruct Viking religions or something, or uh, these kinds of things, you know. Basically, they take, um, you know, a Christian uh, experience of the world, a lot of and then they just exchange, you know, okay, now there is not uh, 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 Jehovah anymore, he's not the, the God, but now it's, uh, it's Odin, you know, he's not the father, you know. And, um, or even if it's uh, various gods, you know, then it, it, becomes a, it becomes like a game. The, the, the polytheism that they have, it's kind of a game. It's, uh, you know, they still connect with the gods like object and subject. Okay, this god has these characteristics and we have to do this and that to connect with them. Change the costume of the deity but not really the source of the power of the deity. That's it. You don't change the experience. The experience is the same. I gave a lecture in, in London once about this at a... At a uh, uh, one of these, um, you know, pagan, heathen conference where just, uh, this was my, my topic, the, uh, the true heathen experience of the world, which is not what they're having, you know? Yeah. First, I'll say you're right about the Goetia practice. <laughs> Second, the point about the teachers is, is primarily why I haven't written another book, but you're, you're advocating a course of action which is damn near impossible in the West. Uh, and it's damn near impossible in India, and it's damn near impossible in Haiti, because most of the teachers are frauds. They have no real spirit, no real spiritual experience to relate. Uh, I mean, in Hinduism, of course, this is the age of darkness, but the advice then becomes very difficult. You're absolutely right. That's a dilemma. This is a true dilemma, and um, I believe though that there is things, there are things one can do. Um, to take the first steps without having a teacher right at the... I think a certain type of awakening process can be, ta can be uh, experienced uh, on its own. Um, but yeah, this is the dilemma of the world. This is the, this is the Kali Yuga. You know, I would like to say, well, yeah, you're right, but here's the, the solution. There's none. You know? um, that is why I'm a great uh, 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 cultural skeptic, and I believe not in, Aeon, not in um, uh, uh, you know, the age is changing now, it's like it was the Aeon of uh, Osiris, now it's the Aeon of Horus or something. I believe in the devolution of the world since the historical time, basically. And um, I believe this is uh, visible um, in exactly, this is one of those things that you witness and um, which characterizes this age. One has to really try to find people to work with. And uh, maybe, you know, some can help you uh, a certain way, uh, uh, but then you have to, of course, um, you know, be careful not to say, well, okay, uh, this was the way you could help me, but then, you know, I don't want because suddenly he says something I don't like. So... That, that's the other thing. Even if you have authentic teachers with real spirits, mm -hmm. and usually they have scars. <laughs> yeah. Lots of scars. They will say things in a money-driven society, again, that will offend the student because it needs to be said, and then, then the student will leave. So yeah. at that point, but that's why that's how you can find a good teacher. I think the teacher can be found if he's not afraid to lose you, because you know, as the Sufis would say, um, you know, if you are the power, you're the power. You're the fountain, you're the fountain. You know, you can, uh, you can, you, you you never change. You have achieved what you have achieved, and you can freely give to the thirsty. <coughs> and if the thirsty comes and drinks, good for him. If the thirsty says you are uh, not a fountain but you are a toilet, um, then um, you know that doesn't change. That doesn't change the fountain. You can call the fountain an apple. It doesn't change. So you know whether people come or not, whether they hate you, love you, um, disrespect you, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's more that the choices that people are making 
I'm heavily biased. Exactly. exactly what you're saying. So it's not just the teachers are frauds, but the seekers are also. I believe. I believe. Frauds. I believe this is yeah. That's for sure. I believe the most seekers are frauds. Not they're not really frauds. I think. Um, I think they generally look for what they're looking for, but they're not looking for spiritual transformation, but they're looking for validation. That's the point. Yes. Yeah. You know? So the seeker is not a real seeker in the classical sense of the term. The seeker is a guy who wants to have respect, who wants to be acknowledged as somebody who does a good job, as someone who is a chief and not an Indian. Are you saying that the uh, deconstructive, reconstructive nature of Um, only half of this arrived here, um, but um, did I understand right that uh, if you take just the chunks out of nature religion that you think are um, interesting or, or, or need, needed and then you pierce them together that you just take what you want and it's not really... Well, you're missing the parts that... Totally, I, I'm, I'm totally against, I'm totally against basically, um, uh, uh, I'm totally against uh, 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 the supermarket of religions where you take this and this and try to... Afford. But it has to be the person to do this, the person to reform must be a master of um, a tradition uh, which has that experience with which then he can um, reform another tradition. So basically he needs to be a master of two traditions, which I, I think is pretty rare. So, I mean, I, and, but so I think it, it, can, it, it would be a person who kind of like um, maybe... You need, you need to, it needs to be a master of a related tradition. For example, I think, you know, maybe a voodoo master um, or maybe, uh, yeah, maybe maybe a voodoo master, uh, or um, uh, 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 a Congo, a Congo priest. Yeah, not even Paolo Mayombe, but the more you know original, um, you know, uh, uh, Angolan by Congo uh, esotericists or masters. They, um, if they are educated enough in the Western, they could maybe, you know, transport some of the things over and reform this type of tradition. And I think we see it in some of the South American traditions, you know, you see a little bit of a mixture, you see um, a, t a type of fusion. Uh, most of the time it doesn't work, most of the time also it's kind of, uh, it's, it's not a fusion, it's a confusion. Um, and, um, but I think it's possible, but you see there are already a, a certain steps towards a possibility. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think it's possible, I think it's possible to, to, to bring some things together and it's and also I believe that if you are a master of one tradition, even if a Buddhist tradition, you can bring in other things. But the problem is, you cannot do this if you're not a master. If you're just starting to bring in a little here and a little there, then it becomes a cluster. No? Yeah. No? Uh, but uh, if you are a master, then you can do this. If you're a master of, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say you're a Thelemic uh, uh, Hierophant, or, th or you are, um, I don't know, uh, uh, the Golden Dawn Hierophant or something, but you're also, I don't know, you study with, um, I don't know, Eastern Orthodox monks or something, and they teach you, uh, you know, important meditational exercises, and you think those are great, you know, and as a master of the system, you could see where they could fit in, that could work, and this, and this is what I mean, if a master has mastered his system, he can import other things um, and know where they could fit, or know where, what is missing. Um, but you have to master the system. It cannot be an amateur. It cannot be someone who just started. It cannot be someone who, you know, um, is just halfway and then he says, like, oh, now it's boring. I don't want to learn it. This is also what you find. People are now, all this, all this splitting of all these groups. Um, some, some is, sometimes it's genuine. Sometimes it's needed. But oftentimes it's, you know, they, don't, they want to be the chiefs themselves. And then, you know, they take other things to make it look a little different. And it, but they haven't reached that station uh, in which they could make um, in Sufism, it's uh, lawful renovations, you know, not to dilute the power of the system, uh, but to do some kind of renovation to bring the system up to the current uh, modern uh, needs. All right, anything else? Or am I <laughs> released into the night? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so, 
and then the spirits themselves keep you further. Um, are you completely against that because of the, the likelihood that you're going to fall into this self delusion? Oh, I'm this all powerful? Or do you think that's a genuine ability to learn through that? Can, can you kind of repeat this again? Oh, I'm sorry. It's only half the right here, and uh, you know, I'm German, so sometimes I'm really uh, sorry. You know, you don't have to no responsibilities to every to anyone, but you can actually have people come to you and you feel better. But no, I don't believe in this. I believe, you know, I the truth the, the true student, even if he becomes a master, will always consider him the student of his master, no matter what. And this is the true attitude, you know, um, the true respect, you know, uh, 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 that a student shows to the teacher. And why would he <coughs> believe him? If the, if the teacher is able, and this is, a, this is a way to find a good teacher, if the teacher is able to induce such powerful states of realization or consciousness or um, experience, I don't believe a student would leave. Um, except, of course, sometimes these experiences are shocking. But of course, so it needs character. But I think, you know, if there's a genuine student and a genuine master, I do believe um, the master and the student will remain uh, together. Okay, again. I'm coming. Let me, let me. Let me. Oh, <laughs> so the, the assumption that, that was being made was that there, there wasn't a teacher available. Okay. So uh, if, if that wasn't the case, and it's not the case in this room, but we all clearly have contacts and stuff, but um, that someone could learn in that method and escape the fantasy. That was more the question. Of, it, yeah. I mean, I think, it's, I think uh, you know, hypothetically it may be possible. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to deny the you know, initiation or the enlightenment of the potato field, you know. Um, it may or may not, you know, one in a million may be good. You know, one in a million, or it depends maybe, of course, it may depend on your pre-studies uh, or your pre- uh, or your level of experience. Of course, you know, if you've already progressed, you know, through uh, a very, very severe school um, and teachings, and then you may, of course, I don't believe this is possible, then you are able to make contact with the master is not the person who makes the contact for you for every spirit or every entity or every power that's uh, available in the universe. You know, that's probably, that's of course uh, absolute nonsense. But um, I don't believe that it's possible to um, be taught by the spirits to develop a grimoire if you just started to open the book. But then, it, then of course, you know, when certain steps are taken, that you on your own can make contact to uh, various spirits that never anybody else has contacted, that's absolutely possible. And that's actually expected from the master. It's expected from a, a, a good student or an advanced student to make his own contacts, to be able to you know, connect to the uh, 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 pandemonic reality on his own terms and in his own way, and develop his own grimoires um, in which he details and deals in a way of the recipes of how to deal with the spirits, to create various cultuses, you know, um, in which he cultivates the relationship with certain spirits or spiritual worlds. So that's absolutely, I agree. I would say that's possible. mentioned the words uh, lineage or egregore or anything like that, yeah. and I'm curious about the relationship between the student and the teacher. Is it is it a lineage egregore type of relationship, or are we looking at strictly a structural type of? Uh, no, I believe that also plays a role. I think uh, <clears throat> I think an egregore, uh, if there is one, is a very very important additional source of empowerment, um, and also uh, a lineage is important. I I'm a very I'm very big on uh, transmission within a lineage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because this also is a way to see whether a person is validated or not, and, and actually what you're studying. Yeah, I was, wondering, yeah. I was looking for the criteria. There. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for bringing this up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. So that's an important point. Yeah. I don't know if this is more of a comment or question, but uh, in the Middle East, uh, there's some things that are kind of misperceived with uh, what validates a tradition. In, in the West, it's somewhat misperceived. Like in the West, most of the like Jewish people you see are really Reformed Jews that are basically secular. Okay, the ones with the hats and the beards are a completely different story. Um, when there is an actual uh, identification of what's called a Mahi, which is a celestial teacher, the person will become possessed. They will have an epileptic fit. They will fall on the floor. The room will fill with the smell of flowers. And a completely different voice will speak out of their mouth. Okay, that is in the Jewish tradition. But you won't see that, and you won't even hear about that, really. It's not really discussed out of those circles. But if that entity is a part of that person's soul root, and they cannot back to it. But they're not really given that by the pursuit of the entity. They're given that when the worlds are united within them. And that includes both the natural and metaphysical worlds because they're not really superimposed. They're interposed within each other. But really in the Kabbalistic tradition, if, if they're not uh, Actual evidence of those things, it would not be con it would not be considered connected to a actual uh, valid tradition. But I think that's more what you're getting at with the kind of uh, pulling in that uh, force that people are not aware of. Yeah, when I say tradition or transmission or something or lineage, I don't mean you know um, accepted by the <coughs> orthodox or accepted by the you know, a mainstream uh, political uh, party, um, but um, I mean a lineage as in an existent lineage which is uh, seriously and um, uh, focusedly uh, passed on for a very long time. So, yeah, interesting stuff. I um, found it really interesting, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. All right. Are we good? All right, thank you. <laughs>